Well, it is absolutely great. It is wonderful to be with you all this morning. If you don't know me, my name is Josh Kelso, and uh, I was part of Grace Bible Church at its inception. My wife and I had the privilege of really growing up here literally at Grace Bible Church. And then a little over a year ago, uh, April 29th of last year, we were sent out along with about 150 from Grace Bible Church to plant Gilbert Bible Church in Gilbert. And that has been uh, an incredible, indescribable joy to be sent out that way. And we love this precious body. We love the care that we have received, the discipleship, the shepherding that we've received for two decades here. We are thankful for the fruit that we see uh, flowing from that, not only in our own lives, but of those who were sent with us as well. And the support and care that we received, that we continue to receive from Grace Bible Church is, is really overwhelming. Every time someone asks me how things are going uh, at Gilbert Bible Church, it, it's an opportunity for me to boast in God's grace and kindness to all of us at Gilbert Bible Church and how he's used this church, Grace Bible Church. I, I really couldn't imagine being sent better uh, The financial resources are incredibly sweet, but the spiritual resources, the care, the investment, the countless hours of discipleship and prayer and equipping and to send so many from grace to be a part of Gilbert Bible Church, it's really allowed us in this first year to just hit the ground running with various ministries at the church. And I want to give you just a quick update on Gilbert Bible Church. I know many of you are curious, and so just want to share some of the highlights, some of the things that are going on. Just recently, about two weeks ago, we finished our first book of the Bible together. We were working through Philippians, and we made our way through that. Tyler is currently preaching through Deuteronomy 31. He's taking four weeks to preach through that chapter. And then in early July, we will be picking up the book of 1 Peter, which I'm excited to go through that. We're doing well. Our membership continues to add. We were planted with about 150 from here at Grace Bible Church, and we're well over 200 now. It's been a wonderful rate of growth for us as a church where people that are coming to Gilbert Bible Church are getting plugged in. They're becoming members. They're involved in small groups, or we call them fellowship groups, and uh, plugged into equipping ministries. They're serving Uh, We are still meeting at Discovery Community Church on Lindsay and Ray. It's been a wonderful home for us this last year. They have been so hospitable, so kind. We meet on Saturday nights still. And uh, while that's not our long-term ideal, that's what the Lord has for us in this season. We continue to look for a long-term home, but with the amount of families that we have, the amount of children, uh, I said we have a, a little over 200, maybe 210, 215 that are a part of Gilbert Bible, and I think it's something like 94 of those are under 18. And uh, you guys know the struggle is real. It's a wonderful struggle to have, and, and we love it. But we have, we have many children. And so having a facility like Discovery, where we're not moving a trailer, we're not unloading and loading up each week, has been a blessing to our families and really enabled wonderful fellowship to take place uh, just in our proximity to one another and the ways that we get to serve one another. We meet from 5 to 6.30 on Saturday nights. You are allowed to visit. Okay, so we would welcome that. However, we want it full disclosure. I was telling somebody before the service, if you come three times within a quarter, your membership automatically transfers. We've already <laughs> taken care of the paperwork. And so just be warned. You've been warned. Uh, what else have we been experiencing? Uh, well, we have fellowship groups, as I said. That's our version of small groups. They're not small. Neither are yours, but the, the fellowship groups are, are what we have. We have three uh, they, they're thriving, wonderful care for one another, and the body takes place there. We finished our first year of what we call EQ, which is equipping men, equipping women. It's our version of Build and Wellspring. We finished our first year of that. We've had various classes that we've gone through together. We enjoy other ministries together as a church youth ministry. We have an older elementary ministry, similar to your uh, Keepers and Defenders. We call it D64. Um, Fellowship gatherings once a month. We gather at a church, at a park, or our green belt at, by our house somewhere, and we just enjoy time together as a church. Um, 
Other men's, women's ministry gatherings are taking place, mom's group, mom's group. And what has really been remarkable has been just the personal care and love for each other that we've experienced from, from day one, just a sweet intimacy. People serve faithfully, sacrificially, lovingly. Tom Tyler and I talk often about how um, thankful we are and how we're not only loving the ministry the Lord has given us in this season, but we're actually finding ourselves uh, just really refreshed in it, invigorated in the ministry. And that's, that's actually quite opposite from what I heard outside of the context of Grace Bible Church in regards to what being sent out as part of a church plant is like, that usually you go and you wander and you have to um, find your identity and work to establish disciplines. And, and again, that's a testimony of God's grace through all of you, the pastors of this wonderful church, uh, that we didn't have to figure out what to do as a church. We had a strong ecclesiology. We had a, a love for God, a love for each other, a love for his word that has really allowed us to just hit the ground running. And so we're very thankful for that. And then lastly, just a couple things to encourage you if you're curious as to how to pray for us. Uh, here's a few ways you can pray for us. Pray for our servants. We have many of them. It takes a lot to make things happen as a mobile church meeting in another place's facility. Uh, also with so many children and new ministries starting up and just not the abundance of resources that a larger church has. Um, we just need endurance in that. Pray for our ministry in the community in Gilbert. Pray for our faithfulness to God's word and the gospel, especially for the elders in regards to that. Pray for our courage and endurance in ministry. We've got a year behind us, and we're hoping for many, many, many more. And we need God's enabling power and grace to do that. And then continue to pray that our love would abound for Jesus all the more, that we wouldn't lose sight of our, our Savior, that our love for him would flow into every aspect of our ministry as well as our love for each other. So wanted to give you a little bit of an update. Uh, thankfully, the buses are running late. They won't be back till 1.30, so we should still have plenty of time to make our way through Philippians. You can open up to Philippians chapter 4. Julie and I were talking, and uh, if you don't know, we, I led the, the student ministries here for many, many years, and we're like, oh, so this is what it's like on a Sunday during youth camp. It's pretty sweet. I like it. This morning, I want to look at God's word regarding what God has to say about sinful fear. And as you're turning to Philippians chapter 4, it's important that we understand what God has to say about sinful fear, about worry, about anxiety. And we all are very well aware that anxiety is a real, a very real issue. At Gilbert Bible Church, no one ever struggles with anxiety, but I've heard how others do. And so I thought this would be, no, I'm just joking. We all do. We all at times find ourselves struggling with anxiety, with sinful fear, at least tempted towards fear. And for most, if not all, at various times to various degrees, we struggle with sinful fear, with anxiety. It's not abnormal to have to address our hearts regarding sinful fear. This is especially evident and necessary, particularly when hardship comes, when trials come, when uncertainty is introduced into our lives or challenges in life come our way. In seasons of difficulty, these oftentimes expose areas of weakness in us. And undoubtedly, for each of us at various times, it has exposed fear, worry, and in those times of trials, it can draw to the surface areas where we lack faith, where we need increased maturity, where we need to be sanctified. We all have these areas in our life, areas we need to grow and be conformed more into Christ's likeness in, areas where we need to further mature in our walk with the Lord. And this reality of the need for growth, it shouldn't be a surprise to any of us that we haven't arrived yet. We should actually desire, as lovers of Jesus, those who love Jesus, we should desire for these areas of weakness to be exposed so that we can address them, so that we can grow, so that we can mature. It's not a threat to us individually to have our areas of weakness revealed to us. It's a blessing. It's a grace from God. Our Savior is a loving God. 
We have a loving Father who gives to us what we need to be victorious over areas of def- deficiency, and He is patient with us while we get there. Isn't that amazing? He's generous in giving to his children the provisions that we need to grow and honor him, to not be dominated by sin, and he is long-suffering with us as we struggle and strive towards holiness. And so to whatever degree sinful fear or sinful anxiety is an issue for you, I want you to hear something this morning. There is hope. There is hope for you. There's hope for all of us who are in Christ. There is hope for us in the provisions of God to be victorious in our battle against sinful fear. It may be a lifelong battle. We're not promised that it's not a battle. But you can have hope to grow and to mature and to not be dominated by anxiety, by sinful fear. Worry, anxiety, sinful fear, it is a prominent battle, and it is a prominent battle even among Christians. We find in our society, in our culture, in many ways this sin has been justified, it has been rationalized, it has been minimized, it has been defended, It has been turned to be viewed as though the perpetrator of sinful anxiety is victimized by anxiety. You're a victim of anxiety. But God is clear that you are not a victim of anxiety. You are not a victim of sinful fear. Each one of us who experiences sinful fear or anxiety, we are the perpetrator Each of us lack trust and faith in God when we find ourselves anxious. We're actually called specifically to not be anxious, to not have sinful fear. And there are undoubtedly legitimate concerns that the Christian can have and be aware of and burdens and reactions that we have to various circumstances for clarity. But we aren't talking about adrenaline rushes over intense moments of danger. If you're at the top of a 40-foot ladder and you look down and you get a jolt of reality coursing through your veins and find yourself being more careful, that's not something you need to repent of. I was spearfishing in Florida a couple years ago and it was particularly a rough day in the water. It was very murky in the water. And as I was fishing, a five to six foot long black tip shark came through the murk and was swimming right towards me. I could only see about 10 feet in the water and it was swimming for me. I had this dinky little spear and I turned it. I'm thinking, I'm a godder. (laughs) And it got about three feet from me and it turned and then swam away and disappeared. I was terrified. I just kept swimming in circles. Like, where, how is this thing going to come at me? Then I yelled to the guy that I was fishing with, there's a shark. Apparently, black tip sharks are very non-aggressive towards humans. They rarely bite people. If they do, it's kind of a nip and run. So I wasn't really in imminent danger, but I didn't know that. It looked like the kind of sharks that love to eat people, <laughs> especially people like me. That's what I felt. So I yelled to the guy, there's a shark. He goes, cool, keep fishing. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he was crazy and the fear that I was experiencing was rational in that moment. That's what I keep telling myself. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about right now a fear and anxiety that is rooted in distrust. And not distrust of anything, but actually a fear. Every fear, every sinful anxiety is rooted out of distrust in God. That is, should be no place, that should have no place in the life of a Christian. A lack of faith in the sovereignty and goodness of God. This sinful fear and anxiety, it's rooted in self-focus, self-concern, doubt, anxiety, unrest, uneasiness of the soul, anxiety of the unknown. And this kind of fear, it is devastating. It is crippling. 
both at the practical level of living, but it is also devastating to the spiritual life of the believer. Anxiety, anxiousness, it is crippling. It's typically actually not even rational. Researchers at Cornell University conducted a study that followed people over an extended time, and they discovered that 85% of what people worried about never actually happened. Then of the 15% of worries that came to fruition, 79% of the time people handled those problems better than they thought they would. And that means according to the study, when they did whatever math these smart people did, 97% of the time there wasn't actually anything worth worrying about. 97% of the time things that were worried about either never happened or they were handled by the individual better than they anticipated and they attested that they learned something valuable in the process. Only 3% of the time did people's worries prove well-founded. And yet, and yet, even those so-called well-founded worries aren't benefited. You don't honor God. You don't glorify God when you worry about them. If you're a believer, you are cared for by a good, sovereign, benevolent, loving God. And Jesus says, birds don't even worry. They are cared for. Every single bird, God feeds them. And by comparison, you are far more important, far more valuable. So don't be fearful. Don't be anxious. So let's look at our passage and look at God's instruction for us regarding anxiety. Read with me Philippians 4. We're going to look at verses 6 and 7 this morning. Paul writes, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Anxiety is troubling. It zaps your strength. It distracts from spiritual resources. And yet this passage, it is so clear, so succinct, so comprehensive. It gives guidance with practical disciplines that produce absolute, absolute glorious outcomes. Verse 7 puts forth the outcome, and it is the peace of God. The promised outcome is not sinful fear, not debilitating worry, not distrust. The outcome is supernatural peace, otherworldly peace, enabling courage to press forward in life for God, who is our fortress. And this peace, it, it guards our heart and our mind in Christ Jesus. That is the target. That's what we're aiming at. That's what we're looking towards. That's what we want to have manifest in our life. That is what we are told awaits the one who follows God's prescription for battling anxiety, for putting to death anxiety. And here's the blunt reality. If you're not experiencing the supernatural peace of God you have reason to take personal inventory this morning because that is not God's desire for you. That's not all there is for you. This is absolutely crucial for each of us individually to consider, but this is actually crucial for you as a people, Grace Bible Church, as a church. God's people are not to be people of unrest, God's people are not to be people of anxiousness or uneasiness or of fear other than the fear of the Lord. And listen, dear friends, there is no reason the church experiences fear and worry and rest. There should be no reason that the church would experience these things, whether it be cultural issues, whether it be financial issues, whether it be political issues, whether it be relational issues, there should be no reason we feel a need to control, that we feel a need to manipulate those around us or our circumstances to get what we want so that our unrest is dealt with. To try to manipulate people or circumstances around us to get the outcome that we think is favorable, that we think is best. 
Not when there are passages like this. Not when we see what God has to say about the issue. When you come to a passage like this that gives you such a a wonderful comfort and experience and promise, it should instill in us a resolve. It should instill in each one of us a courage to press forward and to meet our fears head on, to address our anxiety head on as God prescribes. You might be thinking, well, now I have sinful fear about my propensity to sinfully fear. I'm sorry. Just stick with me, okay? We'll get there. God's word is rich. He will help us. You don't have to be dominated by sinful fear. Maybe even hearing this this morning is a discouragement to you so far because you know the fear that has dominated your life and your thinking, the anxiety, the unrest of your soul. And listen, listen, there is hope for you this morning. This isn't a word of condemnation from Philippians 4. There is hope for you to not be dominated by that. Do you believe that there is supernatural peace on the other side of your anxiety? Because God says there is. Do you believe God is who he says he is? And are you willing to do the work of following God's direction to get there? The question is not, is there peace available or will God be faithful? The answer to those questions is a resounding yes. There is peace and God will be faithful. Rather, the question is, if I'm not experiencing the peace of verse 7, the way that God promises, where am I not using the tools that God has given to me? And again, as I said earlier, it shouldn't shock any of us that we haven't arrived in our walk. If, if there's need for growth in this area, that shouldn't undo you. We all have need for growth. We're all in the same boat. We all need God's work to continue to have its way in our lives. God has given the believer unique tools that lead to supernatural peace, and that is what we see in our passage. We see God's battle plan for addressing anxiety. God's battle plan for addressing anxiety. God has provisions for you to address sinful fear in your life. God has a prescription for the believer to not be dominated by sinful fear, but to actually experience supernatural peace. So that's what we're going to look at this morning is God's battle plan for addressing anxiety. And number one, we see first that we must understand the prohibition. Number one, understand the prohibition. If we are going to fight anxiety, if we are going to battle anxiety, if we are going to put sinful fear to death, we must understand the instruction. To obey the instruction, you have to understand the instruction. And so look at verse 6. It's right there. Paul says, be anxious for nothing. For nothing. This is the command, and the command reveals the root of the problem. Anxious fearful, worried, unsettled, phobic. It's to be burdened when you shouldn't be. And if if the solution or opposite of this is supernatural peace, then for us to obey this, there should be a, a peaceful rest of the soul, not an unsettledness of the soul. And the instruction here is to be anxious for nothing. Be at sinful unrest over nothing. One pastor summarized sinful fear this way, saying, it is, to be, it is to demand to know what isn't yours to know and to demand control over those things that are outside of your control. And yet in this command, God is not calling you to be indifferent over the needs of life or care for others' needs. This is a, a care that we are to have. There are burdens that we are to bear. There are desires that are good. We plan We seek to be diligent. We give intentional thought to things of the future and cares for life and cares for others in this life. God calls us to pray and pray over things and to seek his guidance. We pray for our life. We pray for our kids. We pray for grandkids. There are legitimate concerns of life for salvation of loved ones, for provisions that we humbly and dependently look to the Lord for, for health that enables us to be able to live vigorously for the Lord. 
but we are not to live under fear of those things. Unrest about what may happen pertaining to those things. We bring them to the Lord, we press forward in faithfulness, and we trust with submissiveness. Not being anxious doesn't mean there aren't very real burdens that we bear. Each one of us has burdens that we are called to bear. We bear the burdens of living in a fallen world. We bear the burdens of sin. We have to navigate the sorrows that come from sin and from living in a fallen world. We help others bear their burden. Each individual bears their own load. Galatians 6 says, help others and bear your own. However, if what you are burdened about in this world is not governed in the midst of that by supernatural peace, something is not as it should be. Something is wrong. As that is not God's intention for his children. When we are anxious, when we experience sinful fear, it's because we're trying to be in control of the things that God tells us that he will take care of. That where it, that's where it comes back to being an issue of faith, of entrustment. Ultimately, this is a battle of the mind. It's a battle of faith in God. What do you actually believe about God? What do you believe about his care for you? What do you believe about his character? We must understand this prohibition, this call to not be anxious about anything. Don't be anxious about anything. It's clear. It's clear for us. The first step in God's battle plan to addressing anxiety is first understand the prohibition, understand the call to put aside all anxiousness, all sinful unrest. Next, the next component of God's battle plan for addressing anxiety is number two, comprehend the scope. Comprehend the scope. You have to see this. God's word says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything. Do you see that there in verse six? Be anxious for nothing, but in everything. You just have to comprehend the scope of what is about to follow. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, everything, let your requests be made known. We're going to talk about prayer in a moment, but understand the scope in which your heavenly father wants you to come to him as it pertains to sinful fear and worry. Everything. Everything. You can come to God in everything. Have you ever wanted to tell something to somebody? You were kind of waiting your turn. They were distracted. They were working on something else. And you thought, oh, they probably don't care. It's not that big of a deal. And you just move on. There's no sinful worry, no anxiety, no unrest of the soul that God doesn't want you to bring to him. Just think about that. Every anxiousness, Every anxious moment, God desires you to come to him in everything. Everything. God says nothing is too insignificant. There's no anxiety too small. Nothing you should be ashamed to bring to him. There's no ridicule for you as you come to him. God will not mock you for bringing something so small, so, so irrational, so insignificant. There's no belittling of you for coming to him again. Really, the same issue? Haven't we dealt with that issue? You're, you're coming again? There's none of that. No reproach for coming to him. God wants you to bring every issue of anxiety. He cares about every one. He already knows about it. He already knows about every one. And he calls you to come to him in everything. The sovereign God who knows every star in the sky, every grain of sand in the sea, every person on the planet, every bird of the air he cares for and provides for. This sovereign, omniscient, omnipotent God, all-knowing, all-powerful God says no worries too small. Nothing that you should just be able to take care of on your own. Bring them all to me. Bring them all to me. 
I care. In everything, every anxious moment, every fear, God calls you to come to him. He invites it. He doesn't grow impatient or get worn out by your worry. Your worry may wear you out. It doesn't, it doesn't wear out God. God doesn't get worn out with you bringing to him your worries. You come to him, bring the, the same request, the same battle. But my child, they don't know you. God, would you save them? They need salvation. God, this conflict is coming up again. This broken relationship is still not reconciled. Oh, the bills are due again. I have to wait on another doctor's report. This health-related symptom is back. God never grows weary. Bring those fears to him. God is never burdened by your burdens. Come to him. And you have to understand the depth of God's care for those who are his. He is so committed to your godliness, so committed to your sanctification. Uh, turn for a moment to Romans 8. You can keep your hand in Philippians 4, but turn to Romans 8. Sometimes we have burdens and we don't even know how to communicate those things to God. The burdens we have, uh, we don't know how to bring them to God, yet listen to the care of God for his own. Romans 8, verses 26 and 27. Paul says, in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us, intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Beloved, when we don't know what to pray, the Spirit of God intercedes with groanings or language or inner understanding too deep for words. And when you have a hard time even expressing what you need to God, when you don't know how to express these things to God, the Spirit of God searches our hearts, takes our struggles, helps cast aside wrong motives, takes the sin and the garbage aside and what is right and pleasing to God and what is in our hearts according to God's will he searches all of that within us, takes it to the Father who sees all of our hardships, all of our pains, all of our struggles, and the Spirit of God intercedes for us and helps on our behalf. That is the care of God for you in your struggle, in your anxiety, in your fear, in your worries, in your doubt. And you may think, I, I want to deal with my anxiety, but what if I do these things? What if I go to him? What if I bring it to him yet again and nothing changes? Sometimes that's actually the point. The cure for anxiety isn't things changing around you, but for God's work to change what is within you. That's what each one of us should desire. The hardships of this world, the sorrows of this life, the difficulties and struggles, the lot that the Lord may have for you in this world, that may never change in this life. But God's work in you gives to each one of us a certain, secure hope to have a other, an otherworldly peace dominate our lives. Not fear, not anxiety not unrest of the soul. The cure for anxiety isn't things changing around you, but God's work to change what is in you. You went to God. You humbled yourself before him. You obeyed the call to come to him. There's peace available, available for you, not because this is the means of getting God to change your circumstances to how you want it, but because this is how God, by his spirit, will change you. You start to trust where you doubted. You start to endure where you were faint-hearted. You start to fight where you were crippled. 
so you come to him in everything. Lord, I don't even know what to pray sometimes. So God, whatever is bad in me, whatever is of a bad motive, help sift that out and everything that is good or pleasing to you going on inside of me right now, draw that forward to the forefront. Understand the prohibition. Next, comprehend the scope. Number three, God's battle plan for addressing anxiety. Number three, make requests known. Number three is make requests known. Look again at verse six. It's right there. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, and then he says with thanksgiving, and we'll come back to that, but he says with, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Paul says, by prayer and supplication, make your requests known. Prayer here is simply the normal common word for prayer. It's bringing things to God. And supplication is coming to a superior in devotion with an expression of need. And these going together express this idea of coming to God as an act of devotional worship and a cry for personal need. There's an element of expectant faith here. He is going to care for you. He is going to give you peace. He is going to give you rest as you come to him worshipfully and dependently. To make your requests known with prayer and supplication is to come worshipfully with a yielded disposition to God. It's to lay your burdens at his feet. To cast your burdens upon him, to make your requests known is not to make demands known. And that's an important distinguishing reality. Come with requests. Come with a humble disposition of worship, not with an arrogant disposition of right. God, you owe me this. God, give me this. God, why did you choose to do things this way? This isn't coming to God. This is putting God on trial. No. We come with a humble disposition of reverent worship, making our requests known. Don't come to God with an attitude of prominence over God where he needs to give an explanation or some sort of defense that you should gain from him, garner from him. If you come with that attitude, you should not expect peace from God. In fact, God's silence in those moments very well may be the Lord chastening you as he withholds his peace until you come to him in worship and submission. Rather, come to him in prayer. God, you are God. You are good. You are righteous. You are in control. God, you have made beautiful, wonderful promises to your children. You do not lie. You never fail. You never change. You give good gifts to your children with good purposes for those who are yours. And so, Lord, help me to trust. Help me to believe. Help me to endure. In the moment of struggle, place before him your struggle. Make your requests known with prayer and supplication. Align your heart to value what God values. God, help me to be faithful right now. Help me to entrust myself to you right now. Help me to make much of you in the midst of this affliction right now. How important, how important is the discipline and practice of prayer for the believer? This is really the crux of addressing anxiety, is to come to the Lord humbly, dependently, to look to him for his strength, for his power, for his enabling work, to do in you what you can't do on your own. None of us can conjure up the peace that comes from God. It only comes from God. And so we come humbly, dependently. There's also a disposition that we're to have as we come to him, and that's number four in God's battle plan for addressing anxiety, and that's commit yourself to thanksgiving. So make your requests known to God, but actually come in your worshipful submission with a heart of gratitude. Commit yourself to thanksgiving. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. 
And in this making your requests known, there must be coupled with this worshipful petition, a commitment to thanksgiving. This thanksgiving, it is the posture of the soul before God in these requests. You make your requests known with thanksgiving. This is an absolutely key tool in addressing anxiety in your heart, in addressing unrest in your heart. To battle anxiety is to battle the mind and to set your mind on the reality of what you have to be grateful for is to shepherd your heart away from what you believe you are entitled to or entitled to know or experience. And it sets your heart on the gifts of what you have received. How many of you who were here at Grace Bible Church when Tom Angsted was here were given the homework, right? 5,000 things you're thankful for. No, it was usually 50. 50 things you're thankful for in this situation. It is a balm for the soul to set your mind on what you have received from God that you in no way deserve to cultivate thankfulness. No fear is too small or too insignificant to bring to God. No sinful fear is truly rational when thinking rightly about God. Do you get that? How loving of God to want us to come to him with every moment of distrust, every moment of worry, every moment of anxiety, when the reality of the matter is there is no fear or worry that we experience or unrest of the soul that is truly rational when thinking rightly about God. He is so patient. He is so loving. He is so kind to us. And again, just thinking of Romans 8, Paul says, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up over freely, how much more will he not give us all things? And that's God's promise, an argument from the greater to the lesser. God went to the fullest degree to save you at the cost of his own son, at the crucifixion crushing of his own son so that you might be forgiven of your sins and reconciled to God. If he would go to that extent out of love for you when you were godless, helpless sinners, how much more can we have a confidence that he's going to give to us all things that we need to navigate this life in a manner that is pleasing to him. Each one of us can have a bold confidence in the character of God when we come to him with a disposition of gratitude, and there is always something to thank him for because we can always return back to the gospel. And when we do that, it instills hope and confidence and comfort. We recognize God's supreme provisions in Christ, and we can give thanks. What are some categories when your view is skewed with fear, when your mind is numbed by anxiety for which you can also be thankful for? Listen, in battling anxiety, be proactive. Don't wait for the moment of intense unrest to try to figure out what to do. Make a plan. If fear, if worry is prominent in your life, if there are moments where you find yourself struggling, proactively plan and make a list of things that when your thoughts are clouded, you know you can come back to, to renew your mind with genuine things to thank God for. Write down a list of things you are always ready to give thanks for. As I just said, the gospel the care God has already given to you. Worship him for Jesus. Worship him and thank him for the forgiveness of sins. You can thank him for his invitation to come to him. Thank him that you are able to speak to him. Thank him that you have Christ as your good shepherd, as your savior, as your master. Make a list of God's promises. I know Cameron Dodd did a lesson in Wellspring A couple years ago, I I don't know if she's done it recently, but on the promises of God, we did a similar one in our equipping men and, and women's ministry. We did two lessons on the promises of God. Just make a list of the promises of God that you can set your mind on and thank him for. They reveal his character, his trustworthiness, his faithfulness in those moments of doubt. Make a list of God's promises. When things seem so uncertain or so volatile, so scary around you, bring your heart to what is true and certain, particularly about God. God, you promised to sanctify me. 
God, you promised to provide. You promised to not leave me or forsake me. Thank you. Thank you that regardless of how I feel right now, as lonely and as dark of a place as I feel in this moment, I know that you have not left me and you have not forsaken me. Thank him that you will never be separated from his love. I don't feel lovable and I don't feel loved. Thank you that my feelings are not the dictator of truth. You love me. Thank you. Thank you that I will not be overtaken by temptation. I really want to fill in the blank right now. Look to worldly means of dealing with my anxiety. I really want to just find a way to escape the hurt that I feel right now. I really want to find a way to appease the unrest in my soul in ungodly means. Thank you that I have a way of escape provided by you, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Thank you that you promise no condemnation in the midst of my weaknesses for those who are in Christ. Thank you that you paid in full the debt that even this moment of disbelief deserves. Listen, has God ever once been unfaithful to you? Has God ever once lied to you or deceived you? Has there ever been a bait and switch with God? Has God ever overpromised and underdelivered? Of course not. He is supremely trustworthy, faithful, righteous, loving, generous, benevolent, and so we give thanks in everything. Come to him and give thanks. Well, lastly, this morning, as we look at God's battle plan for addressing anxiety, we'll end where it ends, but also where we started. Know the assured outcome. Take heart. Know what awaits you. Know the assured outcome. We see this in verse seven. Look at verse seven. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What a promise. What a reality. When we follow God's plan, for addressing anxiety when we obediently and submissively deal with anxiety through disciplined prayer and worship and petition with thanksgiving, we can have an expected result, an assured outcome. Transcendent, otherworldly peace from God. Peace which surpasses all comprehension. From the world's perception, it is inexplicable peace. Peace. Peace for the Christian, and collectively, that leads to peace within the church for God's people. The peace of God that quiets anxiety is both beyond the fleshly mind, it is beyond intellectual reason. The world can't understand it. We've all seen this transpire. How are you the way that you are in the midst of what is taking place in your life right now? That's God's peace. That's what is there for one who is living beyond this world only, but has eternity awaiting them with the creator of the universe. That's God's peace. One author referenced this peace this way. He says, the peace which God gives is both incalculable by the mind and unconquerable by our worries. That's God's peace that awaits the believer. And so hardships, sorrows, trials, difficulties, struggles, disappointments, ailments, they all may persist, but your heart, your inner man, your mind will have peace in the midst of whatever circumstances the Lord may have for you. Peace, which quiets anxiety, it causes it to dissipate. It overpowers it and is like nothing you can find on earth. And listen, for us, this may not be perfect, may not be constant, but when we are doing this well, when we are making requests known with a humble, worshipful disposition, we can expect God to be faithful and to give to us a supernatural peace. 
We're brought into the state of peace with God through the gospel. And for those who have experienced the gospel's power, there is for you now peace with God and peace that is available to you from God. You are positionally at peace before God because of the work of Christ and because of the enabling power of God through his spirit working in the life of the believer, you can have experiential peace in your disposition before him. There's one condition for this peace to be available to you. It is only available for those who are at positional peace with God. You will never, ever experience this transcendent peace if you are not reconciled to God through Christ. You must know Jesus. You must have turned to him in faith and repentance. You must forsake a life lived for yourself and commit yourself by God's grace to living for him. You must repent and trust yourself to the righteousness of Christ. Paul in chapter three goes on a wonderful explanation of the folly of a false man-centered gospel that looks to man's righteousness, man's ability to pull himself up by his bootstraps, man's ability to make himself right, says it's all rubbish, it's all nothing, it's all loss compared to the surpassing riches of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord. In Christ, there is forgiveness of sins. In Christ, there is a righteousness for you. In Christ, there is peace before God. There is reconciliation to the Father, not only positionally because of what Jesus has done, but there is also peace that awaits the one who continually entrusts their life and their circumstances to God, looking to him, submitting to him, yielding to him. God, I don't know why you chose this path, I don't know why you allowed these things to transpire, but I do know this, nothing, nothing happens outside of your sovereign will. And so whatever circumstance you find yourself in, if you want this peace, it must start with faith and repentance in Jesus Christ, looking to his righteousness and trusting yourself to him. And then from that, follow God's instruction here for addressing sinful fear and worry. And you can expect supernatural transcendent peace to follow. What an immeasurable gift of God. Just step back and look at the world that we live in. So much unrest, so much worry, so much fear, so much anxiety, so many superficial maskings of the true issue are put before you and me constantly. This morning, from God's word, we see something substantial, something true, something stable. We see our God who is faithful. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus in every moment of fear and know that his peace is accessible for you through God's grace. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your tender care for us. You know our struggles. You know our propensities. You know our weakness. You know our failures. You know our disbelief, our doubts. And yet you still love us and you care for us and you even equip us from your word to not be dominated by these old ways of living that would look to horizontal means of addressing things in our life, but you point us to yourself, the true remedy for all things. You give to us a hope. You give to us comfort and peace. Lord, I pray for these precious saints here, these brothers and sisters of Grace Bible Church. 
thank you for their faithfulness to you, for their love for you, their love for Jesus, their love for your word, their love for holiness, and their desire to glorify you. I pray that your word would be a a, a great help for them this morning as they continue to grow and mature in Christ, that they would be further equipped to be able to fight anxiety and unrest of the soul and experience the peace that you desire, that we would be more useful for you as a result of your work in us. And Lord, where there's discouragement and faint-heartedness of spirit, thank you that we don't have to navigate the worries of this world and the troubles of this life independent from one another. And so, Lord, I pray that they would be a great help for one another in this battle sharpening and encouraging and aiding one another, that we would be people both here at Grace Bible Church and also at Gilbert Bible Church who are governed by supernatural peace. Lord, that we would have instilled courage within our souls to press on in faithfulness regardless of life's circumstances. That you would be seen as the great God that you are, that you would be glorified. Help us to always and ever look to Jesus. And we ask in his name, amen.